evenly dividing the gospel. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. The Apostle Paul exhorted believers to follow him and to remember him in all things. He could confidently make this request because he was God's chosen spokesman to deliver the majority of God's truths to the New Testament church. The command for believers today to follow Paul is no less important than God's instructions for Israel under the law. It is important to understand that those who ignore God's spokesman disregard the commandments of God. Many Christians could give several reasons why they discount, spiritualize, or ignore the significance of Paul's statement to follow him. Some teachers have even suggested that Paul's bold pronouncements are simply a man unjustly venerating himself. Clearly, if Paul's statements were truly the sentiments of a mere egomaniac, the deception was far-reaching. In fact, within the context of Paul's command to follow him, he praised his audience for keeping the ordinances he delivered. For the Bible believer, these distinctions are important because the shifts in spokesmen add clarity to the will and purpose of God in every age. The varying viewpoints over Paul's authority present a crossroads where each believer must determine the path he will follow. Some will consider these instructions as merely Paul's recommendations. Yet the words of God's spokesman recorded in the canon of Scripture, whether Paul or some other person, were never to be considered the dismissible rantings or opinions of a mere mortal. They are, in fact, the words and will of God himself. For this reason, Paul's epistles specifically contain God's commands to follow Paul as he followed Christ. God simply used Paul as a chosen instrument to instruct believers. Specifically in the context of 1 Corinthians 11, 1, the commandment was to follow Paul and the ordinances given to the church. The ordinances given by Moses in the law were not continuing and binding upon the New Testament, and therefore new ordinances were necessary. Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The law's ordinances, footnote number one, read these passages for a sampling of the abolished ordinances found throughout the Old Testament. Exodus 12.43, Numbers 10.8, Numbers 19.2, 2 Chronicles 2.4, etc. The law's ordinances, those given by the hand of Moses, 2 Chronicles 33.8, were abolished in Christ prior to Paul's ministry. Although the church may not have been completely aware of when these Old Testament ordinances were abolished or blotted out, Paul indicated that Christ nailed them to his cross. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The New Testament church was given its own set of ordinances to supersede the Old Testament ordinances. Failure to recognize these transitions and the God-given ordinances set forth for the New Testament church has caused confusion, error, and at times even heresy. In addition to church ordinances, Paul's epistles offer the necessary clarity of the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. It is important to understand that this is not to say that Paul was the only one preaching this gospel, but that God used him to define it and distinguish it from previous gospels. Paul's gospel distinguished. As stated earlier, there are three Old Testament passages, Isaiah 52, 7, Nahum 115, Isaiah 61, 1, quoted in the New Testament that implement the word gospel. In each case, the quotation from the Old Testament into the New confirms that the phrase good tidings is equivalent to gospel. Isaiah 52, 7 and Nahum 115 are found in Romans 10, 15 and Isaiah 61, 1 in Luke 4, 18. This is an important concept because it reveals that in a basic sense, the word gospel refers to God's good tidings. However, each gospel set forth in Scripture contains additional descriptive information to set it apart from gospels preached in other periods. As it pertains to the gospel of God's grace, the Scripture clearly defines it as Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15.1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul referred to this gospel as the gospel which I preached. This personal declaration infers that, number one, 
other scriptural gospels had been preached in the past, and number two, other false gospels were being preached during the time of Paul's ministry. Plainly, both during the time of Paul's actual ministry and the continuing into today, any gospel preached that is contrary to the gospel preached by Paul is counterfeit gospel. Galatians 1, verses 6 and 7. It is wrong because it is false altogether or because those particular good tidings were for a different period or time and are no longer ordained of God. Paul's Gospel Revealed Paul was not the first one to teach concerning Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the elements that make up the gospel, the grace of God. Prior to Paul's conversion, we read that Peter, Acts 2, 23-36, Acts 3, 15, Acts 4, 10, Acts 5, 30, and Philip, Acts 8, 32-37, preached about the crucifixion and resurrection. In fact, it was this message that brought conviction to those responding during the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.37, when some gladly received the word and were later baptized, Acts 2.43. Stephen stopped short of the message of the resurrection as martyrdom interrupted his sermon, Acts 7.52. So, some might wonder what significance Paul played in this gospel. First, we know that the gospel was not revealed to Paul by word of mouth. Peter knew and had preached the gospel, but he did not take Paul aside and expound to him the way of God more perfectly, nor did any other apostle. Paul did not read about the revelation of the gospel in the writings of the so-called early church fathers, nor did he learn about it from any other apostolic writings. Why? Because the gospel Paul preached was not received or taught to him by anyone except through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1.11, But I certify you, brethren, the gospel which preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The chart on page 330 is called Paul's Gospel. God's direction was changing, and he needed a new spokesman. God chose to give the gospel to Paul by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The uniqueness of this presentation surely demands our attention. With the apostle still living when Paul was saved, it should seem unusual to the reader that God would use direct revelation to give the gospel to Paul unless there was a specific purpose and plan for this unique mode of transmission. After all, this was never done again for anyone saved after Paul. Thus, we are drawn to contemplate the following three points. Number one, why did Paul receive the gospel by direct revelation from the Lord? Number two, number two, why did other apostles not simply convey the gospel to Paul? Note, none of the other apostles were even permitted to lead Paul to the Lord. Number three, was this gospel something that the other apostles did not yet fully comprehend or understand during the Lord's earthly ministry? Paul's gospel communicated. It is critically important to understand when and how much the apostles understood concerning the cross and resurrection. Some teach that no one knew these truths until Paul, while others teach that those before the cross were looking forward to Christ's sacrificial death. Both positions are wrong. Interestingly, the timing is quite easy to pinpoint. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked the apostles whom they thought he was. Simon Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. This confession seems to be the turning point because five verses later we read that the Lord began to foretell concerning his death, burial, and resurrection, Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must first go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. From that point forward, Christ's crucifixion became a frequent theme of the Lord's teaching to his apostles, i.e. Matthew 16, 21, Mark 9, 31, Luke 18, 31 through 33. Yet the Bible clearly points out that the apostles did not believe, nor did they understand, his prophetic words until shortly after Christ's resurrection, Luke 24, 1 through 9. Carefully read this next verse that shows that Christ intended for the full understanding of his death, burial, and resurrection to remain a mystery until after the resurrection. John 2.22 When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. The conflict concerning the apostles' understanding continued into Paul's ministry. At one point, Paul wrote concerning a visit he took to Jerusalem, where he communicated to the leadership there concerning the gospel he preached among the Gentiles. His visit was not intended to teach the apostles something new, but to confirm that there was no conflict between their messages. Galatians 2.1 
Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. The Bible does not say that Paul had a monopoly on the gospel. In fact, Paul wrote that the Spirit, not Paul, revealed many of these truths to others. Ephesians 3, 5. Yet Paul's epistle to the Galatians clearly distinguishes between the recipients of Peter's and Paul's preaching, the circumcision versus the uncircumcision. Galatians 2, 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter... For he that wrought effectually in Peter the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Galatians identifies Peter as an apostle to the circumcision, that is, the Jews, Galatians 2.8. When these leaders of the church in Jerusalem saw that Paul's gospel to the uncircumcision was truly blessed of God, they extended to him the right hand of fellowship. Galatians 2.9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. They accepted Paul's teaching as the same truth that they were preaching among the Jews. While they were comfortable with Paul's ministry, they still unmistakably recognized the distinction concerning their primary audiences. Peter struggled with finding a balance concerning his association with the Gentiles, especially when Jewish brethren from Jerusalem were around. Galatians 2.12 For before that certain came from James, he, that is Peter or Cephas, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Paul's Gospel Veiled since the fundamental elements of Paul's gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection had already been revealed to the apostles, what new information did God reveal to Paul alone? Paul proclaimed the full purpose and effect of the cross, something which had remained hidden prior to the revelation given to him. Ephesians 3, 2 For ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four and few words. The Lord repeatedly told others of his death, burial, and resurrection prior to the cross, Luke 18, 31 through 33. But their understanding was not opened until after the resurrection. John 2, 22, John 12, 16, Luke 24, 45. The truth was hidden from them. If God had opened the apostles' understanding prior to the cross, Satan would have gained an understanding into its purpose also. Had Satan understood the cross, he would never have instigated Christ's crucifixion. Convincing Judas Iscariot to betray the Lord, John 6, 70, would have seemed quite foolish to such a wise and crafty creature such as the devil. Likewise, he would not have convinced Pilate to wash his hands of the matter, Matthew 27, 24. Instead, Satan was completely convinced he was defeating God by encouraging the Jews' rejection and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of the Gospels Number one, the book of Luke. The apostles were not hindered from hearing about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection during his earthly ministry, but they were stopped from understanding it. Passages like Luke 18.33 reveal the truth of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, yet the very next verse, Luke 18.34, clearly states that they did not understand what the Lord was talking about. In fact, the truth was hidden from them. The chart on page 334 is titled, The Twelve Sent to Preach. Here's the verses from Luke 18.31 through 18.34. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, and spitted on. They shall scourge him, put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Verse 34. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. The ramifications of these truths should be quite troublesome to those not familiar with dispensational teaching. According to Paul, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. Yet no one would claim that the apostles were lost except for Judas Iscariot, John 17, 12. The apostles were not the only ones who did not understand. Satan's problems also had nothing to do with not hearing the truth or knowing the truth. 
He simply refused to believe and trust in the truth he knew. Additionally, he has always found pleasure in seeking to thwart God's will by manipulating man to do his bidding for him. For this reason, prior to the cross, God kept Satan and all others ignorant to what the cross was intended to accomplish. The chart on page 335 is titled, Paul's Gospel Hid from the Apostles. Had Satan understood the gospel of God's grace prior to its fulfillment, he would never have instigated Christ's betrayal. For this reason, this gospel message remained a mystery to everyone until it was too late for Satan to thwart God's plan. Instead, he became God's pawn. The scripture reveals that the mystery was kept hidden so that the crucifixion would take place. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan would never have instigated the crucifixion had he realized the full consequences of his actions. Yet, while Christ hung on the cross, Satan may have realized this blunder. He then seemed to instigate the men that crucified Christ to taunt him to come down. The Bible teaches that the Lord laid down his life, John 10, 17 and 18. But Satan became the tool necessary to fulfill prophecy, resulting in history's greatest victory. Although the Lord foretold of his death, burial, and resurrection prior to the cross, he delayed opening their understanding until the right time. Even the apostles' lack of understanding concerning the empty tomb becomes quite revealing when we consider this truth. Luke chapter 24 records the account of the resurrection of the empty tomb. The narrative begins with the women as they walk to the tomb to anoint the Lord's body. Instead of finding his body, the women find an empty tomb and all are bewildered. Why were they shocked to find things just as Jesus had promised? Because none of them were looking forward to the cross or to the resurrection. In fact, the women assumed the worst. The body had been stolen. It was not until the angels, standing by the empty tomb, repeated the Lord's words concerning his crucifixion and subsequent resurrection that the women remembered his words and believed. Luke 24, 6. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Although verse 7 above clearly described the gospel message so dear to all Christians, verse 8 indicates that these women did not get the message until they remembered the Lord's prophecy concerning himself. The narrative in Luke chapter 24 continues as the women told these truths to the apostles who thought this story of a resurrected Christ was just some idle tales. Luke 24, 9 and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Verse 11, And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. If this information is unfamiliar to the reader, you should be asking yourself why the truth seems so obvious now. The women's testimony of the resurrection seemed to the apostles to be no more than idle tales. The final chapter of Luke's gospel account records that the apostles still did not understand the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. Not until toward the very end of this chapter was their understanding open concerning the gospel of God's grace. Can you imagine Bible teachers all over the world believing and teaching that these apostles preached the same gospel message back in Luke chapter 9 with our level of understanding? The scripture specifically records that Peter wondered about the resurrection. Luke 24, 12. There can be no doubt that he and the others did not understand our gospel prior to the cross, nor did they understand it shortly following the resurrection. Luke 24, 12. Then arose Peter and ran on the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering himself at that which was come to pass. On page 337, the chart is titled, Idle Tales of the Resurrection. No one, including the apostles, received the revealed truth until the Lord supernaturally opened their understanding. In the final verses of the concluding chapter of Luke, the apostles finally understood the death, burial, and resurrection. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. The chart on page 338 is titled, Understanding the Cross and Resurrection. Are these differences before and after the cross? Sure there are. 
Today, a man cannot be saved without understanding the death, burial, and resurrection. The second chart on page 338 is titled, The Gospel, the Kingdom, and Grace of God. Yet during the Lord's earthly ministry, his most intimate and used messengers did not understand the death, burial, and resurrection, our gospel. Not only did these men not understand our gospel message, they too wondered what had happened when the Lord's body went missing. This wonderment continued until the Lord opened their understanding. For this reason, it is quite obvious that those who died before the cross were not looking forward to the cross for salvation any more than these apostles were looking forward to it. The apostles lacked understanding of the resurrection. Therefore, all dispensational teachers teach what is known as dispensational salvation. No one prior to the cross looked forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. This teaching has nothing to do with a works faith based salvation in other dispensations, but simply that things that are dispensationally different are not the same. Number two, the book of Mark. The other gospel books express these same truths simply not to the extent of what is seen in Luke. Since this teaching may be somewhat foreign to the average Christian, consider how the gospel of Mark agrees with Luke's testimony. Mark chapter 9 testifies the apostles' lack of understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection, but explains why the Lord told them of the resurrection prior to the cross, so that they would believe once Christ had risen from the dead. Mark 9.9 9. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they would tell no man what things that they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. Can you imagine a God-called, spirit-led preacher today not understanding what the rising from the dead means? Today, man without this basic knowledge is not saved and certainly not qualified to preach. Without reservation, every honest Bible student would agree with this fact. Yet most preachers and Christians are oblivious to these simple basic truths. Number three, the book of John. As early as the second chapter of John, the narrator of the Bible, the Holy Ghost, reveals that the apostles would not understand the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection until after the Lord was risen from the dead. These truths pinpoint why it is so crucial to be a Bible believer. John 2.18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. The chart on page 340 is titled, Apostles' Resurrection Ignorance. God spoke these prophetic truths to the Jews, but did not open their hearts to reveal this truth until his timing and place dictated their need for an understanding. In other words, the Lord planted the seeds so that they would believe after the event came to pass. Simply put, no one prior to the cross believed until after the fulfillment of the prophecy. John 14, 28, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. Verse 29, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, you might believe. The express purpose for the apostles hearing the truth is evident from these passages. Christ foretold, he prophesied, what would take place. Yet the disciples knew not the scripture concerning Christ's future sacrifice throughout the Lord's earthly ministry. We read this same truth in the final chapter of John. John 20, verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. The chart on page 341 is titled, Planted Seeds. Even after Christ's betrayal, trial, and crucifixion, the apostles clearly did not comprehend and believe the meaning of the empty tomb. The evidence providing the differences in dispensation seems far too obvious to belabor the point much further. Yet there is one more gospel book not yet considered, the book of Matthew. Matthew's gospel clearly reveals the same, but offers another unique perspective. Number four, the book of Matthew. The first half of Matthew's gospel is silent as it pertains to anyone preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, the gospel of Matthew pinpoints when the Lord began to show his disciples these truths. 
after Peter's great confession. Matthew 16, 16 through 18. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter rightfully understood that Jesus was both the Christ and the Son of God, but could not grasp the death, burial, and resurrection. He could understand because he was not supposed to understand. In fact, upon hearing of Christ's plan to die, Peter rebuked the Lord when he foretold of his demise. At the same time, there was a gospel being preached during Christ's earthly ministry, for the Bible says, Matthew 4, 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew nine thirty five, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Matthew eleven four. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and show John again these things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Prior to Christ revealing his death, burial, and resurrection, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. There must be differences in these gospels. These differences reflect why it is so important to study the Bible by rightly dividing it. People are confused when they approach the Bible like they would a buffet. You can't just pick and choose truths without some discernment. How could anyone justify Peter's message as an example to emulate during this period in his ministry when he did not as yet understand the basics concerning Christ's sacrificial death? Peter's ministry and message did not change until after the resurrection. The truth of the gospel revealed in Paul's epistles was also revealed to Peter and the other apostles. Ephesians 3, 4, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known in the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Summary. All four gospel books agree. The apostles alive during Jesus' earthly ministry simply did not understand the cross prior to it taking place. These examples offer further proofs of the absolute necessity to rightly divide the scripture, especially in today's confusing environment. Man lacks no choice of religions, but the wrong choices have spread a famine of truth throughout the world. Amos 8.11 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. As is evident to those who study the Bible, misinterpretation of the scripture runs rampant. Listen to any scripture-quoting cultist or self-promoter, and one can easily recognize the grave dangers involved with not knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth. A cultist is a cultist either because of the willful ignorance of the truth or because he simply refused to accept God's method of Bible study. He or she uses the Bible similar to how an unlabeled buffet offers the smorgasbord of choices without any context. Men wonder why they cannot understand the Bible when they repeatedly ignore God's intended context, which results in a plethora of one private interpretation followed by another. Those who know the truth also know the importance of considering the individuals addressed within the context of any given passage of Scripture. The Bible clearly instructs the student of God's Word how to be a good student. Whether you heed the instruction or simply ignore it determines the extent of truth derived from the matter. Paul wrote, 2 Timothy 2, 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Verse 15 of the same book explains how to consider what Paul said. 2 Timothy 2, 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Consider what Paul said by rightly dividing the scripture, and the Lord will give you the necessary understanding to correctly discern God's intended context. If one verse seems contradictory to another, consider the matter through the lens of a completed canon of Scripture. If some Bible truth seems to contradict what the Apostle Paul or other apostles writing to the church wrote, give the church age epistles precedence. The words of our spokesman are no less the words of God and the word of God than those red letters signifying the words of Christ and his earthly ministry found in many Bibles. 
context must be the driving force. Some readers might still wonder exactly how to rightly divide the Bible. If the gospel books, Matthew through John, reveal the preaching of a different gospel from the one revealed in Paul's epistles, would that not seem like a natural division? Sure it would, and it sure is. The book of Acts, located between John and Romans, transitions from one spokesman to another. This again makes a natural division and a smooth transition from the Jewish apostle Peter to the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11:13, Paul. Will people be agreeable with this method of rightly dividing the Bible? Many will not. Others may hold the same opinion of you as the apostle Paul's peers expressed of him as he taught the truth. Acts 24:14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Any Bible believer that is unjustly called a heretic should never be ashamed of man's feeble attempts to induce shame upon those valiantly standing for truth. God revealed the truth directly to the Apostle Paul, and the religious world called it, that is the truth, heresy. The truth is what really matters, not the titles that men may bestow upon those with whom they disagree. In the end, it is better to suffer for doing right than to suffer or prosper for compromising the truth. 1 Peter 3.17 For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. As we travel through the last days of the church age, perilous times will come upon those willing to take an uncompromising stand for the truth. 2 Timothy 3.1 Truth and error will clash head to head with man's traditions, garnering the best press. A major point of contention will revolve around whether the traditional church model, a major point of contention will revolve around whether the traditional church model has lost its ability to provide spiritual sustenance to the mass of Christians still seeking the truth of God's word. Another point of contention will always involve where truth is and how to know the truth for sure. The church's effectiveness has diminished in direct proportion to the spiritual compromise emanating from the pulpits. In fact, the current generation has witnessed the emergence of a whole new kind of church. The most popular churches have transformed from an emphasis upon soul winning and flock feeding to simply trying to improve society, comfort the unconverted, and amass a large following. It has never been God's desire or will to afflict his people, but to gently draw each one to the light. Lamentations 3.31 says, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Yet acceptance or rejection of truth is your choice, truth and light, or error and darkness. This is the end of chapter 22.